So really when we're trying to implement this in practice, you know, and what are some of the considerations um, that we have to make that are a bit different than when we're thinking about this in kind of a, a more um, less dynamic environment, right? So, you know, there's a couple of things to think about here, you know, obviously scaling this up and ensuring you have the resources to do so um, within your country and context, but also, you know, um, scaling this up in terms of how many people are going to be accessing the system, how many um, entities will you register in your program, and then how does that impact, you know, what you do in terms of training, performance on the system, the kind of infrastructure required to get this all to work. So this session is kind of a, a summary session, and what we're also going to do, we're going to hear from Sri Lanka, um, Priyanka and uh, Pramal, who've been part of this as well as Pamod, um, who scaled up a, a very a significantly large tracker system in response to COVID-19. And, and just they're going to walk you through some of the struggles that they've had to overcome, you know, the realities of, of making this work in a real setting when you're dealing with large amounts of, you know, millions of, of, of records, essentially, right? Um, and, and that it can be challenging in its own way. So, um, there's actually a whole academy on this. So we're just talking about this for about an hour and a half today, but there's a lot of different considerations. Um, so I've linked to some different material and I'll go over that as well. Okay, so when we're looking at, at tracker implementations, um, you know, we, we compare these kind of two concepts, the coverage of the, the program that we're implementing. And I have health examples here and we've used health examples throughout. Uh, that's just more because of, that's my background is what I'm comfortable with, but there are other ways you can use DHIS too. Um, for education is a good one. That's a kind of thriving kind of new new use case, new community of people using DHIS to to track you know children through their their schooling. So um, you know I have health here, but you can think about this you know more generally to other concepts as well. All right, and and you also compare you know the coverage in terms of you know how how many people you're trying to cover with the program with the complexity of the system you're implementing, right? And what are the trade offs there? So, you know, you can think about this in terms of, you know, maybe how many patients are interacting with the program or how many facilities you want to have uh, entering data in real time, you know, and this can all, all impact your coverage in some way, right? And I have a couple examples here. For example, um, this is uh, some examples from Ghana, um, looking at, you know, the MCH program where coverage would be, you know, rather high, you'd want rather high coverage, but the complexity of the program itself, you know, it's, it's pretty low, right? In comparison, to some of the other programs, things like HIV, which are higher on the complexity scale. You know, there's a lot going on with HIV care and delivery. Um, this, and you know, they're enrolled for for a very long time. You know, um, from the time they're they're initially diagnosed and, and receiving treatment for a very long time. Um, and, but you know, conversely, there's typically not as many people who have HIV um, in the system, right? So there is a trade off there between the coverage and complexity. So we, we try to think about this in a way so that when we scale up, you know, we, we kind of work through this to understand, you know, how things might work. Maybe we need to phase things out um, a little bit more. Maybe we need more resources for a very dedicated period of time. For example, the HIV program, because it's quite complex, you might need significant resources to get that up and running at the beginning, right? But then once you do so, it might be, you know, easier to maintain. But uh, especially at the beginning and maybe throughout the run, you need those resources in place to, to kind of manage that. So we've developed this uh, kind of model to, to think about to think about this a little bit more, right? So when we think about the the, the kind of positives of, of implementing tracker at scale, right? So you know, data use is a big one, right? We're entering individual information now, right? And we're able to do a lot with that individual information. Now we've been looking at program indicators as aggregates, but you would also have quite a bit of information on each individual patient. We've been examining briefly, for example, due dates, um, you know, sending reminders as an example for people to come to their appointment. And this has a real life effect, you know, on people's ability to access the system, right? Gives them reminders to actually access real life services. It's not just a electronic or uh, concept within a database anymore. It's, it's something that we can use to kind of affect our service delivery. There are obvious benefits for, for patients and, and healthcare workers because you're able to kind of have that more kind of detailed history on service. Um, and, and, you know, patients will have a more detailed um, history about, you know, what they've, what services they've received as well. This is all kind of registered and tied together to their unique patient record, right? There's also various operational, um, clinical and performance improvements, right? So we mentioned reminders. A lot of you were asking about, you know, things like overdue events. So if they didn't attend their appointment, right? You can then pull up a list of those 
who didn't come to receive a specific service, you can call them, you can send out a reminder to them, you know, you can, you can use your resources in order to kind of follow up with those individuals. And it helps a bit more than if you just have aggregate data. And then obviously, if you're, you know, your, your own policy and research, both in your setting and, and wider in the region and globally, you know, this contributes to this, obviously, because it's kind of a, quite a treasure trove of epidemiological data, right? And you can use this to make uh, informed decisions um, in terms of, of, of your service delivery in, in, the, in the settings that you're working with, right? But there, there are negatives, right, to this, right? Not everything is, is just working efficiently all the time, right? You've seen now that the configuration can be quite complex. And we've, to be honest, only kind of scratched the surface of what you can do, right? So a lot of you had other questions about other things that either you're trying to think through or that you think might be relevant in your own settings, right? Um, and there's a number of ways to implement those, um, either through a custom kind of solution or through adding on to some of the concepts we've discussed that are just a bit more advanced um, than we had time to fit in, right? But th this can become quite complex over time. And this means you might only have a small amount of people who really understand how to manage this, right? And you need to kind of take care of those resources, especially if you have a lot of healthcare programs or education programs or whatever it is that you're managing, right? You also have a high number of users typically, right? Because as you scale the system up, more and more people will be entering data directly into DHIS2. And you need a team to be able to manage all those users, provide support to those users, et cetera, right? You have a large amount of data as well. And the data is now you know, much more sensitive, right? Because you're storing that this personal identifiable information. So you need policies, procedures, you know, and practices, real life practices that safeguard this information, right? It can't just be a theoretical discussion anymore, right? But now you're, you're really kind of taking this, these people's information and you really have to be kind of mindful of what you're doing with that information, right? So what we've done is try to develop this kind of house, okay? Basically, that is uh, laying the foundation for what we would like to see um, at least some of these components implemented um, in place before you kind of work towards scaling up a tracker implementation, right? So start from the very, very bottom, from the top. And, and you know, some of you are implementing tracker programs and you might want to revisit this a little bit to see, you know, if we don't have these things in place, what might we do to kind of think through some of these challenges in our own settings, right? So, so obviously, you know, at the bottom, we have this kind of just overall buy-in, you know, from people. You don't want to do something that's maybe against, uh, you know, senior ministers, uh, you know, ways of thinking or, um, you know, uh, senior uh, or, or kind of development partners that are helping you to support this. Um, it doesn't work if you're kind of going to kind of fight all the time just to make kind of simple things happen, right? Um, and then, of course, funding, right? That's a big thing. And it's not just a one-time cost, right? So... You know, DHIS2 itself, it's a, it's a free system, right? It's an open source system. You can download the software and set it up. But there's a lot that goes into supporting that. And, and you guys probably realize that already by now, right? But it's not just a one-time cost, right? You don't just set it up and leave it. You set it up. There are changes that occur. There's users to support. There's all kinds of training that needs to occur both once at the beginning and then over time as well as, um, you know, as refresher and, and new concepts are introduced, changes are made, et cetera, right? So you need to make sure that at least a strategy is in place, even if all the all that funding is not secured yet, but a strategy is in place to kind of think through that a little bit more, right? Legisl legislation and policies is another big one. And I think in, in many places that we work, these are not necessarily in place. And in the interim, you can use kind of global best practices, you know, um, look at other legislation that relates to this, especially with privacy and, and standards, right? Um, sometimes, especially we, we, you know, unfortunately have people who, who will ignore this to a large extent and just kind of say, well, it's, it's such and such country, this is not an important thing to think about, but really you need to think through this um, in quite a bit of detail, right? Um, and if there's nothing in place, you, you, you kind of need to get that, that started, right? You need to initiate this conversation with those people who would be involved in such a decision-making process to implement this, um, to safeguard these people's information. Um, capacity and competence is another one, right? We've been training you and we've spent 10 days together. And like I said, you know, we've, you know, there's a lot of different concepts we could still talk about, right? You could still spend a lot more time, right? So it's continuous co capacity and competence and not just for people like yourselves who would be administering systems, but, you know, then you have the wider array of users that will be entering data, analyzing the data, right? And that's something you want to really build up over time as well. 
Um, infrastructure is a big one, especially as it relates to Tracker. And we'll talk about this more, especially as we get into the performance issues. And then we have these, these blocks. You know, Once those are in place, we can think about some other aspects of what we're going to do. So IT support is a big one, right? Making sure we have continuous support, training and supervision. You can see how it links to these kind of foundational um, pieces. The scale and the coverage of the system. So how far do you want to go down in your health system? You want to cover all the facilities, for example, in your health system. And if you do, then you know what realistically, you know, how do you plan that out? Um, also feeding into the HMIS, right? So tracker systems look at this individual data, but you know, you would probably have an HMIS system that's been collecting aggregate data for some time. And in some ways, especially when you're first starting out, could be a more robust, more accurate data source, the quality of that information due to all the time that's been spent propping that up, you know, might be to a higher standard. Um, you also have to think through in terms of how you're going to collect this data, right? Are you going to be using web-based devices, Android, a mix of both? And if so, there are specific considerations, you know, based on which approach you decide upon. If it's a hybrid approach, for example, there are both design considerations and, uh, and other scaling and training considerations as well. Um, Real-time versus second data, uh, secondary data entry, that's another one we'll talk about, okay? Just meaning, you know, do they enter this data at the point of, of kind of when the service is received or is it kind of after the fact? And there are different implications there. Hosting and security, right? This is a big one, right? Um, uh, at least as it relates to tracker and it closely relates to this infrastructure block and the whole design and configuration process. So we've really only been talking about this, this here, this one little block during our training, right? So it's, it's, it's a small block in the grander scheme of things. It's an important block nonetheless, but um, there are other aspects to consider. All right, so real-time versus second data, secondary data entry is the first one I wanted to highlight, okay? So this means, you know, are we entering data at the same time that the person is receiving the service essentially, right? So let's say a mother comes in and receives her antenatal care, right? Either during that service or right after that service is provided, we would go and update that mother's record, right? That's one way to enter data. Um, another is secondary data entry, right? Maybe we fill it out in a paper-based register and then someone later goes and finds the mother's record and updates that record. Now this, this secondary entry is less resource intensive, much less resource intensive, right? And it's not going to um, preclude you from providing any service either, right? If you're doing real-time entry and you are saying to everyone, you must enter the data at the same time the service is delivered, this system needs to be available, you know, 100% of the time or as close to that as possible, right? If you're doing secondary entry and the server goes off for 30 minutes, it's not a big deal, right? Because people are just entering data retrospectively. Um, also, you need people at that point of entry then to enter all that data, right? Whereas if you're doing secondary entry, you could maybe consolidate this. You can have one person who enters all the data regardless of, of when the service was provided. So not one approach is right or wrong necessarily. It's just thinking through, you know, how you would deliver that service and, and how you would kind of get to that point. All right. um, so feeding into the HMIS, and we'll talk about this more, I think, in, in a moment. But, uh, you know, we've seen that tracker data aggregates automatically. And it's true that it relieves the data collectors of this extra reporting burden, but there are some extra considerations in very large scale systems. And by very large scale, I mean like systems with millions of records, okay? And I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more as to why sometimes this becomes a problem. And we'll see some of this from the History Lanka team as well in practice, okay? Um, Android versus web, oh, so, some oh, sorry. Um, so some of you have actually mentioned. Oh, give me one second. Here. Sorry for that, everyone. My dog just went a little crazy. Okay, um, so um, Android versus web. So some of you have mentioned that you're using Android already in your implementation, right? Um, and Android allows you to use data offline, right? But then you need additional, you know, we'll talk about capacity too. You need additional considerations then when you're using those devices because, you know, we, we skipped over a lot. You can see actually all the baseline stuff that you would do to make Android work. You know, that's what we've covered. But in, in, on top of that, there's additional considerations such as you know, how the person interacts with the program. That's why all those color and icon options were available, for example, for a lot of the configuration, because you might want to you know, consider other aspects, but also you have that to manage those devices, right? Let's say you 
pick up thousands of, of Android devices. How do you manage those? How do you make sure they're functional and, and that you and can support people to make sure that they can use them, right? Um, you will have lots of users, right? Uh, if you're entering data at that level as well. So there's, there's all these additional kind of considerations to think about depending on which way you go. Um, hosting and security, this is another one, right? So um, we talked about some of the security measures we could implement through various granular controls, right? User rules, user groups, sharing, um, program access levels, right? These are some of the things the software can do to help you, right? But at the same time, you know, the database itself, you know, there are some considerations around how this is hosted and how people can access that information, right? You know, at bare minimum, you know, some of these um, basic server requirements should be met and, and we'll talk a little bit about them not in too much specific detail but we'll provide you some links um, to have a look at this right but you know making sure that uh, this is not overlooked i think it is quite critical right and, and this links to some of the stuff on legislation and policies as well in terms of you know how people decide um, that others can access this personal identifiable information in the country okay the design and configuration process right so when we did this, uh, we've really been working in isolation, right? And, and that's difficult, right? I mean, one, it's an artificial course. So we're using use cases that are semi-realistic. Um, you know, they're based on real world use cases, but we've given you a lot of the kind of information about, you know, how the workflow would look like, how things might be configured in reality, how the form might look like, and how to interpret some of the fields. But you're usually not given that information, right? You usually have to kind of work with others um, in order to identify that. And this process, as I mentioned, it can take a little bit longer, you know, actually this back and forth um, can take a bit longer than the actual, you know, going inside of DHIS2 and, and kind of adding everything to the, to the system, right? Because you're really working then with subject matter and experts who really know what they're talking about in terms of how this stuff is delivered, right? Because the whole idea is to support, you know, users in their work. It's not just to kind of create an artificial oh, this is kind of cool and I want to get this done. Um, but you really want to kind of help the workflow of people um, who are on the ground, right? So it's important to, to kind of understand this more and, and do some studying to, to really work for, through the workflow um, in your setting. Okay. So that artificial process we described at the beginning when we filled in our templates and looked at the programs, you know, that's something that you should really kind of emphasize at the beginning when you're implementing anything new. And then even when you're looking at revising, you know, what you're doing. All right. Um, so scale, right? So um, once again, there's there's some considerations here in terms of the number of devices, the number of users, and then the support you're providing, right? So the, the lower you go down in your system, the higher your scale is essentially, right? So I'm going down to all the schools in my in my country, or all the facilities in my all the health facilities in my country, right? Then the scale of this can be quite enormous, right? Depending on the size of your country, of course, but um, even you know, a modestly sized country with a population, well, you know, over five, five or six million, you'll, you'll have a lot to deal with in such a scenario, right? Um, and you really need to make sure, you know, this can't be run by one guy, you know, sitting in the office, you know, you need a team, you need uh, to train others um, to make sure they can help um, with this um, as well. Okay, and then training, right? So training is a, a big part of this, right? So we've done training now for at the admin level, but all the end user and analysis training, you know, that ends up becoming more important in a way, right? You'll always only have a, a small group of people, right? Not everyone in the country is going to be concerned with configuration, right? It's just really a small subset of people. But when you're scaling up, when you're dealing with large systems, you know, you're going to have to find a way to regularly train people and, and have good content for them to refer to, to utilize um, in their jobs um, so they can, you know, follow these processes. Um, that you've kind of set up for them, right? Um, and especially, you know, you might have differences, different training for Android, different training for web. You might have training on, you know, the analysis of the data that's maybe for another subset of users, right? And just kind of working this all out, all these different um, pieces of the capacity. And even yourselves, right? You might have to kind of learn a bit more about security protocols, for example, learn a bit more about um, various aspects of the configuration. It's, it's an ongoing process, right? It's not just a one-time thing where you do the training once and then you know it's it's done you kind of kind of continuously um, are in this process and that should be implemented into any kind of work plans or anything like that uh, when you're thinking about you know funding as we mentioned at the beginning you really have to think about you know this recurring cost right not a one-time cost 
which is the same for many of the aspects we've described. Okay, support. Okay, this is a big part of implementing Tracker, right? Once again, you need a team that can support people on the ground. All right. There might be, you know, you guys have run into some issues already. Um, I'm having some, I, I try to register a person and it it's, gives me this weird error and I don't know how to interpret it, right? Um, this can happen in the field quite often. Um, and you need people to kind of help those uh, individuals who are kind of stuck, right? And not able to work through that on their, on their own, right? And, and they need a quick mechanism to do so. Um, this is obviously more um, intense if you think about our real-time data entry situation. Right, because then someone will be sitting there, maybe with a patient or client, and it's not working. And 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 if they have no one to talk to, right, it's going to be really, really frustrating for them, um, for both them and the patient, because it will disrupt the service that they're receiving. So so you need to kind of think through this kind of linked together and not in isolation. Right. Okay. So that th this kind of house, I've actually uh, what I've done. So there's a whole bunch of information um, on this. So if you go to the implementation consideration section, um, I've linked to the tracker implementation documentation, um, which talks about all these aspects um, in a bit more detail. Okay, um, there, there's quite a bit of information on, on, on all of this in terms of you know assessing if you're ready um, for using tracker, right? And, and there's actually an assessment tool, I believe, that's linked um, within here. Um, and then, you know, talking about how we would kind of plan for um, implementation itself, right? So I would encourage you if you're kind of either in the midst of one or kind of thinking about doing this to have a closer look at some of this information to really, um, you know, take some of these considerations into account in terms of how you might um, implement this in practice. Right? And it covers these aspects that we've been discussing, right? Hosting, training, Android versus web, um, real-time versus secondary data entry, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right, so we've talked about kind of these, these foundational building blocks, and now I want to talk about some of the, the challenges actually implementing them, and, and I'll hand it over to the Sri Lanka team momentarily to really describe some specific examples. So just a bit of a background here and, and where some of this information is coming from. So last year, we saw kind of a, a really rapid expansion uh, of tracker implementations as a result of COVID-19. So looking at COVID-19 surveillance and COVID-19 immunization. And COVID-19 immunization in particular um, has some very challenging characteristics that we've not yet dealt with before, but that could potentially be extended to other use cases in the future. And we just are trying to kind of get ahead of this and help people kind of make this work as best we can. Though as the Sri Lanka team will report, there's still a long way to go in some cases, right? And they've had to come up with some very interesting solutions, I think, to get around this. So um, now we're having DHIS2 systems come up where we're basically capturing the entire population, right? That's the idea. They might be registered even in advance. So when you go to immunize someone, they're already there and you can find somebody, or they might be just going through one by one and you know registering millions of people. Um, at these sites, uh, literally, depending on your population. And if you're vaccinating, maybe everyone over five, for example, everyone would go in that system um, over five, or that would be at least your goal. Um, so you, you can end up with millions of records, right? And this also results in things like new sites, many, many new users, and a high number of users accessing the system at the same time, right? So your performance requirements are all of a sudden becoming um, very large, okay? Um, because you're having kind of this entire population that's wanting to access the system um, and, and register those individuals in your system. Okay. This means that there's also high requirements for real-time data, right? A lot of people are basically saying, you know, as you receive or as you provide the vaccination, update their record, right? Because there's millions of records, if you kind of leave it for secondary data entry, sometimes, in some cases, right, it gets lost, right? Because the backlog is just too much. Right. If you if you immunize a thousand people a day or something in your facility, you know, and you leave that for a week, you know, is someone going to sit and, and kind of enter seven thousand records on their own? It's it's really kind of difficult, right, to think about. Um, there's also a significant impact of slow or down systems, right? And I kind of alluded to this earlier, right? But if your system is real slow and you're trying to kind of enter this data in real time, or if your system is down, right? This can have an impact on service. You can't enter the data, right? So then it's going to go in the backlog maybe, and then you're going to have trouble catching up. 
um, because of the large amount of records that you're trying to enter. We're also seeing a lot of high usage throughout the day. And this is all, uh, all hours of the day, right? Because people are uh, entering this data, you know, and, you know, immunization services are still occurring on the weekends as well. People are then looking at the data in the evening, preparing releases for their updates for various individuals in the system to tell, you know, give updates on what the coverage is today, how many doses were administered, et cetera, et cetera. So we're seeing a high amount of, of usage in both the entry as well as the analysis side where people are pulling out this information a lot more frequently than we had seen um, before, right? And then this importance of this linked and longitudinal data as well is, is more important, right? Especially in this case, you could have linked programs like um, adverse events following immunization, for example, right? Uh, and, and all this needs to be linked over a, a quite a significant long period of time. We've been in this pandemic for, you know, whatever it's been two years plus, and, and people are still continuing to roll out this vaccination program and it's still growing in scale. So as I'm referring to this, you know, a lot of these findings are a result of COVID-19 vaccination programs. But you could think about this if you're doing any kind of other type of mass population-based activity, right? It'd be the same kind of challenges that, that we've run into as a result of COVID-19. Okay, so our current findings um, on kind of helping a bit with the performance are, are based on kind of six potential mitigation areas. So server requirements and monitoring, right? And we talked about this as kind of one of the baseline components of a tracker system in terms of infrastructure. So it was even complicated when we were dealing with programs that were much smaller in scale, right? An HIV program might only have a couple thousand people registered a year or even less, right? Um, and even then we had you know, to think about the infrastructure um, pretty thoroughly. But now we're talking about maybe millions of records, right? And, and, and then it becomes even more challenging. Um, there's also things we can do on the analytics side to mitigate the kind of performance needs um, of this. Uh, there are also kind of specific tracker solutions and Android solutions um, for people who are using Android. Um, there are various implementation strategies we can also think about. Um, and then this other um, area is where we can use tracker to aggregate data to mitigate some of the impact um, on the server load um, itself. All right, so I'm just going to talk about each one real quick, um, just to give a general overview. So this is more for kind of a server administrator person thinking about this, but really what we're recommending is, you know, make sure you have a, kind of a more appropriate software environment on your server um, and, and kind of a more recent DHIS2 version. Okay, so if you're using an older DHIS2 version, that's on an old patch. Um, if you're using an old kind of um, database environment, um, then, you know, upgrade this as soon as possible, basically, if you're experiencing performance issues. Um, server monitoring is also a good idea. So there are various server monitoring tools for database administrators um, or system administrators, however you refer to them, that they can basically monitor the performance and kind of see um, pain points or, or times when there are problems, right? What are people trying to access? What is going on when the server shuts down for no reason? You know, um, things like this kind of help um, identify some of those in, um, pieces of information. Um, the server is also appropriately sized and when I'm talking about this, I really mean if you're dealing with millions, you know, millions of records. If you're still working on tracker implementations that are smaller in scale, you wouldn't need such a stacked kind of environment, um, uh, such a performance uh, performance environment. But really, the, what I'm talking about is at scale, dealing with millions of records here, right? So we have some minimum recommendations um, on the server, and, and you can see that some of the recommend recommendations, you know, look pretty out there. But when you're dealing with some of these, uh, um, these large systems, then it's, it's really beneficial to have some of this. And this is kind of our minimum uh, spec, I guess, in, in, in some of these cases, right? Um, also, if you can separate the database and the PostgreSQL and have dedicated servers for them. So there's some stuff um, I've, I've linked to kind of a longer discussion on this for people who are kind of interested or want to share this with their server administrators, perhaps, to understand a bit more on, on some of these recommendations, all right? On the analytics side, so one thing we've been working through, you know, the past yesterday, we've been talking about program indicators and how they work. And yeah, they're, they're a wonderful tool. But what we've realized is if you're doing this on systems with millions of records, this does cause some performance issues. Okay. And this is because you're going row by row, you know, tracked entity by tracked entity, maybe millions of times performing a calculation of some kind. Um, and this causes, you know, some, some challenges. All right, and we'll talk about what we might do to mitigate this, right? So uh, an alternative here is, uh, you know, 
sending those program indicators to the, to the aggregate data model, right? So I make my count of whatever it is or my sum, you know, and I send it to an aggregate data element, okay? And uh, there's a document that I've linked to um, that describes this process in a little bit more detail. And we'll also discuss the kind of pros and cons about this approach in a moment. Okay? And especially what we don't wanna do is have a page when a person first logs in with several program indicators that are having to count or assess millions of tracked entities, right? So let's say I have 5 million people registered in my system. I have a program indicator that goes through and has to evaluate 5 billion records. When the person logs in and it's the first thing they see, um, it's, it's going to really slow down um, their system, okay? So um, as an alternative, we, in these large systems, you know, you can kind of do some things for the dashboard to mitigate this problem. Right? So you can, for example, set up a text or only um, an information landing page um, that excludes some of these tracker analytics to minimize impact, right? Or you can limit uh, the dashboards based on kind of specific program indicators and only to those users and user groups who need them for um, a specific purpose, right? And this is kind of against our normal approach, right? Where we just, you know, we want the data to be shared as much as possible. And the data still, there's, you know, people still deserve to see the data. So we have to come up with ways to share that with them. But in the interim, right, if you're kind of really struggling and you see at scale, it's not working, you know, there are some measures you can kind of put in place just as you kind of work through troubleshooting. Well, how do we actually get this to work for everybody? Because in the end, that is the goal, right? Even though, you know, here I have not for general data entry users, this is kind of an initial consideration, right? Eventually, you know, it's, it's nice if the data entry users can see some data, right? Um, and not just kind of, and have no feedback based on what they're entering, right? Um, some other things we can do is enable analytics cache, right? So that way, once it's downloaded the first time, it won't have to do it again. Um, if every time they're logging in and downloading the data, it is going to be difficult, okay? Um, another challenge is this uh, continuous analytics option, right? So where analytics is just running all the time. So you're getting latest updates. Um, it's better to kind of choose a period of time to run your analytics. Uh, maybe, you know, in the middle of the night at like 2 a.m. when people are not accessing the system. That way, if it takes a little bit of time, maybe your analytics takes a couple hours to run. If you're in a large system, um, it won't really interfere with operations and bog down the system. Because if you're running it continuously and people are entering data at the same time um, and you're dealing with millions of records, then, you know, this is a, re a recipe for, for a slow system. Um, another thing we can do for tracker, right? So when we're configuring our program, if you remember, we had this box display front, front page list, okay? Um, if you're having performance issues, you could also disable this. Um, it'll help a lot. That's a very heavy load um, on the server displaying that front page list. So you could disable this and just force people to search um, for the tracked entity they're looking for rather than seeing it on the front page, especially if that front page is not used that much. This, this can help quite a bit, okay? Um, there's some stuff you can do on the, the database end as well. You can apply some custom database indexes for frequently searched attributes, you know, things like first name, last name, sex maybe, um, are, are ones that might be commonly used. Um, but also what helps is if you have unique IDs, these are very fast and very low, low burden compared to um, custom attributes that you've made. So if you have an ID that's unique in the system, like a unique ID, a passport number, of uh, some kind of social service number, um, that you use for national identification um, and searching by that is, is very helpful you know if you have something like that available um, also if you're making um, system generated attributes um, and try not to use this random type of syntax right um, sequential there's a sequen uh, syntax called sequential um, and, you, and this is a, a, a little bit less load um, compared to random especially if you're generating this you know many many thousands of times in a day Right. Um, on Android, so those of you who are working with Android um, or thinking about working through Android, okay, there's a couple of things you should try to get the administrators kind of familiar with before you embark down that path, right? So there's an Android settings app that has various ways to sync data and improve performance. Um, this is kind of a global app, right? So it allows you from the DHIS2 instance to control how all the Android devices interacting with the system will sync their metadata, their data, and this can significantly improve performance, right? If you tweak these settings and understand the implications of these settings for people using these devices, it can really help them um, to access and enter their data. 
Okay. Um, you should also create specific configuration um, for users um, that will access or be using Android, right? So if they have an, a, a data entry configuration or some type of user that's configured to access it via web, you should really think about having a specific user or role or setup, sharing, whatever it might be for that Android user, right? To really kind of describe what they can do, okay? Because the way they interact with the system is going to be quite different, right? Um, also a way to kind of handle all the Android um, devices, right? So uh, there's this concept of, of mobile device management, which allows you to manage a mass amount of devices um, centrally, right? And, and that's one way to do it. Um, but if there are other strategies, there are other strategies that you can think of, you know, even kind of employing district managers maybe to ensure, you know, some, some scenario where they're, they're responsible for the Android devices, whatever it might be, right, an implementation strategy. But, but there needs to be a way where you can control, um, you know, which version of the Android app that people are using, right? And then, you know, management of the device itself, um, you know, if they have problems with whatever on the device, you know, they can't turn it on anymore or they delete the app or something for whatever reason, or maybe you don't allow them to delete the app at all, right? That's another thing you can do is just kind of control what people can do on the device you give to them. So setting those things up in place before you kind of embark on that deployment to help um, is, is very helpful, right? Okay. There are some implementation strategies we can also think about, right? Um, so another uh, another thing we can do is, is try to, in parallel, so you have your tracker program, but in parallel, have an aggregate configuration available for reporting, right? Um, this can be used routinely or as, as a backup in case something happens with the tracker system, right? Um, at least you'll have the numbers for the day, right? Which might be very vital for reporting purposes. Um, if there's something wrong, obviously you want to stop the tracker system from falling over. But in the case this happens, right, this is just set up as a mitigation measure. And if you are using this tracker to aggregate kind of concept, um, then it's, it's useful to have in place anyway, so you can send the data to the tracker kind of, or sorry, to the aggregate configuration, right? Um, and another helpful thing you can do, um, in some cases, it's not for all scenarios, but you can refer to the, these, these metadata packages we have available, right? So there's standard configurations that provide you with all kinds of reference metadata, dashboards, analytics um, that you can have a look at to think about how you might design um, you know, some features. It doesn't mean you have to copy them necessarily, but it'll give you a lot of reference in terms of how you might build something out to make it work a little bit well. Because you'll see in, for example, all our tracker packages or a number of them, they have, for example, a, a ton of program indicators that can be mapped to aggregate data elements as an example. So you can push the data over. Right. And that's the kind of last thing I wanted to discuss. Right. So just to reemphasize. So why shouldn't we use program indicators when we're counting millions of TES? Right. They're very heavy calculations. And if I'm logging in or multiple multiple people are logging in and it's performing these calculations row by row. Right. Millions of times. It can really slow the system down. Right. So this whole idea of tracker moving tracker data to the aggregate data model, um, it allows us to map our program indicators, right, to our aggregate data elements. So we still have a system somewhere that's using program indicators to, to calculate this information, right? But then whether or not that's done on the main server as people are entering data or there's a copy and that's being sent subsequently back as aggregate data or something else, some other mechanism, right? Completely dependent on how you set things up. But this is part of this infrastructure consideration in terms of how you would get this working, okay? And then you would periodically generate aggregate data values from the program indicators, right? So rather than generate the data in real time, right? Every minute they see an update on the dashboard, maybe they only see an update every six hours, every 12 hours, okay? A more realistic time frame to allow the system to process this. And we realize this is not ideal, right? Might not always meet your requirements, but it's better to have the system operational than have it kind of buckle under the pressure of having millions of records um, to deal with, right? And then dashboards itself, if you're if you are having this tracker to aggregate model you know, in place, then you can build the dashboards based on the aggregate data elements. And that way more people can have access to them, right? You don't have to um, kind of control this so much. Um, if it's just aggregate data, you know, then you can have lots of users see this information and it won't really cause so many issues with your system compared to if every user has access to a dashboard with um, very heavy program indicators. Okay. So they're still needed, 
um, but then you just kind of map them um, to aggregate uh, data elements and move the data over. And it's not a completely smooth process, admittedly. Um, there is a document that I've linked previously that talks about it more. Okay, so um, so please refer. There's a full presentation on this, okay, in Moodle. Um, and there was a webinar on this too. So I've linked to the presentation, okay, that talks about those concepts that I described in more detail. And I've linked to the recording of the webinar as well, okay. So this is a full presentation um, on these concepts. Okay, it talks about all these various aspects that I described in, in much more detail um, and provides different resources um, for this. So on the server monitoring, I just had one slide, but there's discussion here on all the different tools that are in place, for example, um, descriptions of what you would see in a typical output if you're setting up some type of performance monitoring, et cetera, et cetera, right? So if you have a large scale system that you're either working with or thinking about implementing, uh, it might be very useful to review this presentation as well as the webinar itself. The link is here. Okay. So um, uh, there's some activity in the chat, which I haven't been monitoring. I see other instructors have been trying to answer your questions. Okay. I'll have a look now, but uh, I, I know this is a bit of a shift in gears, but it's just to kind of think through um, what we're working with. And, and what I want to do now is have um, um, Priyanka and uh, I'm sorry, and Pramal kind of work through um, some of the challenges they've had, right? Because it's very interesting to understand, you know, the effect this has in real life, right? Um, so, um, Pramal, uh, I, I guess, Pramal or Priyanga, I'll hand it over to you guys, um, and we can continue with the session. Okay, thank you very much, Shuraj. Uh, so, uh, you everybody had a very detailed session on implementation consideration. So, let me uh, share this uh, uh, implementation considerations in a uh, practical setup, practical scenario. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Okay. So I'm just going to <coughs> uh, explain or uh, demonstrate what uh, Shurajit have mentioned as con implementation considerations using a real world uh, scenario, which is the uh, immunization tracker we used in Sri Lanka. So uh, my uh, presentation is based on COVID-19 COVID immunization tracker, which used to capture individual level COVID-19 vaccination data in Sri Lanka. So obviously that is using DHISO tracker. So over these nine days, I think you collected a lot of information, knowledge on tracker configuration and implementation by now, but having uh, uh, have, having a look at this uh, practical scenario, I think it will help you to consolidate your knowledge and experiences. So COVID-19 immunization tracker in Sri Lanka. So the, obviously the program COVID-19 vaccination, you can see here on the uh, top of the COVID-19 uh, vaccination. We have uh, 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 so far at, at this time, we have five program stages, first dose, second dose, third dose. Obviously we, uh, very uh, selectively started with fourth dose, so we had to implement this fourth dose program stage also. And this is the final one is AFI, so that is for adverse events following immunization. So basically, uh, scale of the, when we are uh, talking about the scaling of scale of the system, so Shurajit very uh, clearly mentioned that when it comes to COVID-19 related systems, systems are tend to get very heavy in terms of track entity attributes. So in our systems, the COVID-19 tracker, uh, track entity instances registered so far is nearly 20 million with 31 million of events recorded. Uh, organization, uh, organization unit count is six, more than 16,000 and we have 3,500 nearly users with uh, more usually more than 500 current concurrent users at a given time. So currently the database size on the disk is about 240 GB. You can uh, imagine now how uh, this, uh, how heavy this system is. So from now, from now onwards, I am just mentioning the steps we have taken to manage this much of heavy system uh, to, and to ensure the smooth functioning of the system. So as Surajit mentioned, that our server configurations, now we did a lot of changes to our servers to 
match with the requirement. So software versions we are using at the moment is JDK 11, PostgreSQL 13 version and DHI is to 2.35. So we are continuously monitoring our ser uh, servers with both GlowRoot and Muning. The both GlowRoot and Muning we have installed in our servers and we are using those uh, software to monitor our servers continuous, continu continuously by our server management team. And actually we have implemented a two-tier architecture in our uh, servers. We have a separate app server and we have a separate DB server. Database server with 21, 24 CPU cores and 128 GB RAM and 500 GB SSD hard disk. The app server is a different one with 32 CPU cores, 64 GB RAM and 100 SGB SSD. So, and uh, we always ensure a fast and uh, stable internet connection and internal network connectivity. Uh, so we, we, uh, we don't rely on one single uh, internet supplier and we have multiple suppliers uh, with high speed supply. And uh, we are having, as I mentioned, a dedicated server for PostgreSQL database and a database server was optimized. Uh, now you can uh, find the database optimizing procedures in our DHS to documentation. So this is just a, a, a screenshot of GlowRoot monitoring tool. So if, by looking at the GlowRoot monitoring tool, you can have a lot of information of the uh, server and identify uh, issues. And and we also have uh, a, uh, installed continuous resource utilization monitoring with net data, net data with alerts enabled uh, environment. So net data allow us to uh, monitor continuously the about the resource utilization in the server. Coming to the tracker design, so we have disabled display front page list as Shuradit mentioned. And we use on very minimal number of parameters for search. As you can see in the screen, we are using just three parameters uh, for search uh, in our uh, front page. And Max, uh, uh, applying custom database indexes for frequent search, the track entity attribute also possible now, uh, in our context. Uh, we haven't used that, but we have uh, minimized the number of parameters which are being used for search. The maximum number of track entity instances to return in a search, you know, you, you know, you, that can be uh, configured in, when you are configuring your, when you are setting up your tracker program. So we have limited it uh, to a lesser number like uh, 5 or 10, I can do. If you are the tracker design uh, 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 the points we have implemented in our system, so generating unique ID in our system, we are generating a unique ID uh, through the system. So we are using a sequential pattern uh, instead of random pattern, which could be uh, performance wise uh, uh, having some issues. Custom modifications of tracker capture. We did some sort of custom modifications to the default tracker capture app in view of uh, improving the uh, functionality. Tracker capture updates event data values individually, though that is the normal thing. Now that is how it works usually in default setup. This can cause database role level looking because of database role level looking. This this can cause uh, some performance issues in the database server. So to overcome this, we have um, uh, in our uh, instance, we have done a very custom change not to send or event data one by one, but we have changed the complete button as but what you can see in an uh, event to save and complete button. And we are, we are sending all the data at once to the server so that the hit to the servers are limited so that the row level locks are limited. So and when we are working with a high number of concurrent users, this is very important. And we gained a very a, a great improvement in functionality with this custom development. 
and only few widgets on the tracker dashboards are visible in our system because um, there are you, you can see there are a lot of widgets you can uh, see in the tracker dashboard but in our vaccination tracker instance we have allowed only very essential uh, uh, widgets so basically the profile widget and the data entry widget we, we have selected tabular data entry because that is much more easier for the data entry users and coming to the dashboard so we are we have configured a dashboard which is publicly shared with just with text so if the landing dashboard consists of uh, analytical element which needs some uh, database connections and analysis so once uh, a lot of lo a large number of users are logging into the system so that the, the performance will be uh, limited and compromised to overcome that we have uh, we have designed a plain dashboard without any analytical elements just with some text so this is the landing dashboard which does not need to uh, run uh, sort of analysis uh, in the server so this is the uh, uh, so uh, once a lot of lot uh, a large number of users are logging into the system the uh, uh, so, so problem to the server is much less in this uh, context again about the dashboard design so dashboards now we have designed dashboard for different levels now we are not uh, sharing the same dashboard for each level, but we have designed uh, separate dashboard for separate levels. So for an example, institution level uh, separate dashboard, regional level separate dashboard, provincial, national level separate dashboards. And we uh, populate those dashboards only with very essential items and share those dashboards uh, with uh, the on, only the respective uh users who need this data in a very frequent manner for decision making we usually don't know most of our users are data entry users for so data entry accounts for data entry only users we are not share, sharing dashboards so they are usually don't uh, see on dashboards or see data when they because they are main uh, objective is to enter data to the system uh, and uh, our database the, the, uh, our dashboards we have confined our dashboards to only to frequently used analytics items only where uh, uh, some, uh, without having a large number of unnecessary analytic items on dashboard we have confined to essential number of or the, or the uh, very needed uh, analytical element in the dashboards and also we have uh, we have we are not including this sort of heavy visualizations from in on the dashboards uh, for an example maps with lower level log units so if you are uh, drawing a map with a very low level log units so it takes a lot of time to load and the of the burden to the survey is high Event reports more than with more than hundred rows again uh, will give a burden to the server. And visualization requesting lengthy period, like if you are uh, visualizing the entire vaccination information from the beginning of the vaccination, which is now more than one year, so that that will take a lot of time and resources. And visualization with enrollment type program indicators, usually when you are cal calculating dropout rates this happens now it takes a significantly uh, uh, large time uh, to calculate and also uh, to the burden to the server is very high so we have uh, uh, we have uh, <coughs> not included that sort of heavy objects in our dashboards as a practice and we are we, we have minimized the use of program indicators in the dashboards so we have formulated or we have created uh, favorite items and stored when needed only the uh, user can load them and see the uh, favorite items but we have to to great extent we have uh, not included 
this uh, dashboard items with program indicators because some program indicators may compromise the performance of the system. So as an additional help, so weekly basis, we are preparing a detailed analysis of the COVID-19 vaccination status of the country. So, and uh, transfer, it, uh, 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 transfer it to a PowerPoint presentation and we are uh, distributing all over the country to the decision makers so that they need not to again analyze, again and again analyze those things because this they receive this weekly report in, a, in every every week and they can, if, you, if they need some further analysis, they can uh, do that uh, without doing that basic analysis. So analytic wise, now we have uh, <coughs> identified, we all know that running analysis, 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 analytics is the most resource intensive activity in the system. In uh, Sri Lanka, COVID-19 vaccination system that currently takes around six hours to run analysis. So uh, we have uh, scheduled analysis uh, at uh, midnight and up to 6 a.m. it is running. Uh, so, but it doesn't have that much of impact on uh, this for the system users because system users usually uh, begin the use the begin use of the system uh, after 7 a we have turned off continuous analytics because continuous continuous analytics the system uh, we observe the system was very slow and uh, as shurajit very clearly mentioned the converting tracker data to aggregate data model is a very very good uh, approach to overcome some of these uh, performance issues now, uh, in our system, it is in progress. Now, I, I have mentioned that the process of converting tracker data to aggregate data model uh, in the following illustration. So you have tracker data in your program, in your uh, instance, on your tracker instance. And with, with program indicators, you are calculating the necessary values. And through a script, you populate some uh, uh, some aggregate data elements or indicators through those program indicators and you are populating your dashboard using those aggregate data elements or indicators. So this will reduce the burden of the uh, tracker data uh, model to the uh, system because uh, analytics using aggregate data uh, is much uh, uh, less resource intensive than the tracker data. When we come to the caching, so we have enabled caching for DH, uh, in the DHIS2 configuration. You all know that you can configure uh, caching in system settings under analytics. So we have uh, enabled cache for one day until 6 a.m. And we have set the cache ability to private to avoid Nginx cache. Through user management, also we have uh, gained uh, a significant amount of uh, uh, control over the system. So we have created several user groups on depending on their level of access and activity needed, uh, the activities needed to perform, and user roles to assign system access and functionality which are necessary to uh, perform the activities. And you all know through sharing settings. Metadata and dashboard was, was shared uh, among uh, the respective user groups. So for each level, we are having data entry and data view users. We are sharing data entry accounts only with the data entry personnel and data, uh, data view accounts we are sharing with the decision makers uh, or those who are need, or those who, need, uh, those who uh, uh, require uh, to visualize data uh, for uh, several purposes. And user training and user support also is a very important part. This is not a technical thing in the system, but if you don't address these user training and user support, so your implement, implementation will be in trouble, especially in COVID-19 vaccine system, systems like COVID-19 vaccine systems. You don't have enough time. You, you are, you are, the, time, the time available is very limited to 
perform this user training in when, when it comes to national implementation national, national scale up so you need to uh, address to a larger community at a uh, very limited time period so our strategy was we developed one page guide so what is as you can see one page guide the very simple user guides with lot of illustrations rather than text which can be understood by even a person who is not well literate in computer using the computer so we have uh, we have formulated one guide for a, a, a each important action so for the data entry person they need they are one guide then uh, for a data data entry person they can just have a look at that guide and uh, continue data entry and also we have developed several implementation guides and standard operated operative procedures and also we have developed very short videos to demonstrate the activities in the system so through this modalities we could uh, overcome this uh, challenge of user training in a very short period all over the country and uh, actually uh, we uh, very uh, we didn't had uh, sort of uh, face to face trainings but with these strategies we could overcome those user training challenges and user support we also with the ministry of health we have established a proper mechanism to user to reach for the help through the telephone we have introduced to the email even through the fax or through some uh, social media channels they can reach us we have three tier architecture to su su support the users the front line or the help desk is a tier one they may uh, give solutions to most of the problems of users and if they are not able to uh, provide a solution then the problem will be passed to the tier two where the most of the moh officers are there and they can attend to most of the advanced uh, issues and resolve them and finally the most technical uh, oriented issues now we are getting as is sri lanka and those all so this tier 2 architecture is working fine and we support uh, uh, user proper user support mechanism is a must or oh, very important thing to succeed your implementation so i think that's what i have to share with you uh, in terms of sri lankan experience uh, thank you very much for listening to me so uh, shuraj it over to you thank you yeah thank you pranga for for sharing i think it's useful for you guys to see um you guys you know the scale of that system is is really big right 20 million tracked entity instances and growing um i might add so so you know they've dealt with some of these and and you can see a lot of the guidance it's actually reflected upon their experience, right? Because they've gone through this and kind of dealt with some of these things um, before we had any idea that this would be a problem, right? So um, they're really kind of leading the charge to, to make a, a lot of this happen because of the scale of what they're trying to achieve. And, and you can imagine, you know, if you're trying to do something like this in, in Nigeria or Indonesia, you know, your, your population sizes are, are even bigger, right? Um, so, you know, just th thinking about these considerations can be important in such scenarios. Um, if you're dealing with smaller countries, you know, like smaller island countries, for example, um, then there's di a different set of considerations, right, due to geography. But uh, in these case of these large systems, a lot of these challenges are shared, right? So I, I hope you were able to get something out of that. And thinking about all the different things we've been configuring over the past couple of days, you know, how you might apply some of this to mitigate, you know, some of these challenges that, that you know, Priyanka has been describing.